You can't see them. But with almost everything we do, we leave behind digital traces. Over the years, those traces build up, creating a unique data footprint that allows others to track where we are and what we do. And the consequences could be dire. That will result in 360 degree surveillance. So how can governments use big data for good? And when does it become intrusive and need to be stopped? From DW, this is Techtopia. And in this episode, we investigate how governments analyze masses of data about their citizens, making them ever more powerful. We explain how this can help our societies prosper, but how it can also give rise to surveillance on an unprecedented scale and erode the pillars of democracy. And it's those at the edges of society who are first to feel the effects. This is a class issue. They, they are doing these experiments in, in the uh, slums. This is SQ Masood, and what he experienced in the streets of his hometown of Hyderabad provides hints for how authorities in India use data on its 1.4 billion people. It was in the spring of 2021, and Masood was on his way home from buying groceries at a local market. So police stopped me here and they asked me to uh, remove my face mark. So I asked why. They, they have not uh, given any explanation and they said, uh, just remove your mask. My name is Sayyid Khutbuddin Masood. Uh, people used to call me SQ Masood. I am a social activist and I am I'm born and brought up in the old city of Hyderabad. When I saw tablet phone in the hand, I understand they wanted to take my photographs. Masood kept asking why, but got no answers. So they have discussed themselves but they have not uh, responded to me. And then things went fast. They have moved back and taken my photograph with my bike. So what did the police officers want? And what could this encounter reveal about how police in India use big data? We'll get to that, but first, let's take a step back. To understand the power of big data, it helps to picture the data you create day in, day out as a satellite image. Each data point in itself is like one pixel, essentially useless. Only together they reveal a bigger picture. Like satellite images show that storms are forming, your online search history can tell who your friends are or which political views you hold. At the same time, technology now allows us to comb through data and find things that would have otherwise remained buried. Companies, for instance, can know that women are pregnant before they tell their families by seeing that they buy items like pregnancy vitamins or calcium. On a larger scale, big data can help governments anticipate and meet our needs as a society, say by predicting birth rates to plan for how many teachers will be needed in the future. It is why more and more of them are tapping into pools of data they have about their citizens from healthcare to education. And it is why they're eager to collect more and more of it. Which brings us back to India and the city of Hyderabad. In the days after he'd been stopped in the street, Masood kept thinking about what happened. This uh, issue was triggering me. Where they will use my photograph? With uh, home, they will uh, share these photographs. He wrote to the police, but again hit a wall of silence. This is a class issue. They can't do this exercise in the posh areas. The educated and elite people can question them, but the poor people, due to fear, they can't resist. Uh, Masood texted me that he was stopped by the police, but I wasn't surprised where he was stopped is one of the over-policed places in Hyderabad. My name is Srinivas Kodali. I'm a researcher who is working with Free Software Movement of India. This excessive policing is very targeted or at specific places where marginalized communities live, people from poor or people from low caste backgrounds or Muslims. That makes the old town different from other areas in Hyderabad, which have since the 1990s grown into one of India's leading tech hubs. 
Hyderabad was one of the early places in India which wanted to be integrated with the global world. We were happy to experiment any new technologies. Those experiments extended to all areas of society, including law enforcement. Our police has digitized every aspect of policing. But only little is known about what police do with all the data they collect. Data such as the photograph of Masood. What is it that you suspect the police wants with this photo that they took? They are building databases and making profiles of everyone in the city. The police in Hyderabad did not answer our interview request or a list of written questions we sent. But everywhere in the city, we saw surveillance cameras that were installed over the last couple of years. Researchers now call Hyderabad one of the most surveilled cities in the world. And the question is, why all the cameras? As a smart city, we are probably would be, I would say, comparable to Delhi, better than most other cities. On a scale of, say, 10, I would say we are probably at 3 or 4 right now. While the city is way ahead of many other cities, we still have long ways to go. So I'm Pramesh Loganathan, I'm a professor. Uh, I primarily work on innovation, entrepreneurship and software engineering. And I'm also the faculty in charge for this center, which is the Smart City Research Center and Living Lab. Smart cities is a big focus area for us as a country. Uh, technology solutions that can help cities with improve the quality of life. Researchers at the center analyze data, for example, to predict mosquito infestations, to better understand how rooftop coatings can help cool down buildings, or to forecast when the air is the cleanest so that people with respiratory diseases can make plans for when to leave the house. We work on water, environment, pollution, uh, transport, uh, health and uh, safety. And when it comes to safety, the CCTV cameras play a key role. Like this city has about 35,000 cameras on the roads. Today, that system is being used to monitor remotely or to investigate a crime. And something has happened, they go back and see what happened. And the same cameras, he says, could also be used to automatically detect suspicious behavior and alert police that something's wrong. This beautiful, powerful technology resource is not being used to prevent crime. It can be used. And now they're talking about it. So, you know, how do you strike the right balance between harnessing the power of this data while at the same time making sure that um, people's privacy is protected? So it's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, it is a little bit of a challenge. But then, like, see, this data belongs to the government. It's with the police. I would not be worried so much about this data. See, at the end of the day, if you can't trust the government to keep your data safe, who else can you trust? Governments actually pose a great risk to the rights of individuals if they do not apply um, safeguards and principles. The two opinions you just heard sum up the key controversy over the use of big data by governments. Proponents say it helps countries get rid of bureaucracy, better understand the needs of their citizens and provide services accordingly. But skeptics warn that the more governments know about citizens, the more control they have over them, creating an ever-growing imbalance of power. So how do you strike the right balance and what kind of safeguards are needed? To answer those questions, it's key to understand one breakthrough in technology that fueled the rise of big data. Technology now allows computers to analyze data at the very same moment it is created. Cities use that, for example, to monitor traffic data and reroute cars once streets fill up, helping residents avoid getting stuck. But if the technology is fed with personal data, it can also be used to take surveillance to the next level. Take CCTV. Back in the day, officers would have to watch through hours of video surveillance footage to find whom or what they're looking for. Today, Facial recognition software can do that job in milliseconds and alert officials that their suspects are leaving the house or meeting with others. It's what's called live facial recognition and it marks a shift in how authorities can monitor public spaces. While previously surveillance had to be targeted at certain suspects, those new systems instead trace everything and everyone. 
This can give rise to a world of dragnet surveillance, where everyone potentially is a suspect, and where it's becoming impossible to move around without potentially being tracked. In particular, China's efforts to build up an all-seeing tech surveillance state have made headlines. The country is reportedly using big data to step up social control, suppress minorities and silence political dissent. But is this only about China? No, because once you look closely, you realize that other countries, including those considered democracies such as India, are also ramping up their big data efforts. I believe they are building a database of people taking photographs. This is about the misusing of powers of the state. And facial recognition is only one tool in an entire arsenal that can be used for big data surveillance. So I've been filing lots of freedom of information requests. We call them right to information in India. And a lot of these documents show that the government has been trying to build these 360 degree profiles. And they call this real-time governance. We are trying to become what people call a digital republic. The model that we are following is something that has been implemented in Estonia. Estonia, the tiny nation on the northeast edge of the European Union, went through a couple of rough years after regaining independence in the early 1990s and then embraced a digital transformation like few others. Since the beginning of 2000s, uh, there has been a steady progress and, and uh, approach to uh, build and digitalize uh, not just the government, but the whole society. Today, citizens can do almost everything online, from renewing their passports to casting their votes. And now you can also apply for getting married online, but you have to uh, show up to actually say the commitments, but uh, the application itself can be done now also digitally. So what's the, what's the difference between India and Estonia? Uh, in case of Estonia, because the European Union already has a data protection law in place, uh, they, they follow it, they adhere to it, and there are a little safeguards. In India, we don't have them. Data protection. Those are the rules that define who can collect and analyze your data and for how long to keep it. These questions have gained urgency in the age of big data, but they're not really new. Data protection law started to appear as a field of law in the late 60s, early 70s. In 1970, after public administration started using early computers, a regional parliament in West Germany passed the world's first data protection law. It was a reaction to the country's experience with the authoritarian Nazi regime and concerns that new technology could make the state too powerful. The other concern was that the state had just become more social in the sense that uh, the state had to distribute social benefits. And if they will be distributed with the help of computers, that needs to be fair. Fast forward by almost 50 years to the late 2010s, when the EU introduced its general data protection regulation, widely considered the toughest data protection law in the world. That's why today EU citizens, including those in tech-savvy Estonia, have a right to understand virtually every piece of information that is collected about them. If a public authority um, collects some data about citizen and uh, processes it for the benefit of providing public services, the public authority also has to expose to the citizens what information is known about this person and how it is used. And what about the rest of the world? We have data protection laws adopted or updated in virtually all of the jurisdictions of the world. But then the situation on the ground is very different. That's why we now have a potpourri of data protection laws around the world. But only in a few regions, painted dark blue in this graph, data is protected by laws as rigid as those of the European Union. In 2017, we had the right to privacy decision by the Supreme Court of India. The Supreme Court said that the right to privacy follows from the fundamental right to life in the Indian constitution. However, since then, there has been no law which would actually effectuate the right. So there is currently no data protection law in India. There is 
no saying how the government is collecting and processing and the data that they're collecting from the citizens. My name is Anushka Jain. I work as the Associate Counsel for Surveillance and Transparency at Internet Freedom Foundation. The NGO is tracking how surveillance in India is on the rise. And the origins can often be traced back to a series of terrorist attacks that struck the country almost 15 years ago. On November 26, 2008, terrorists stormed buildings in Mumbai and killed 164 people. The 2611 attacks in Mumbai were viewed as a massive failure of the Indian intelligence community because you know they were not able to assess that such a big attack was being planned. After 2611, the government decided to put in place a lot of projects which would allow them to invade into the privacy of, of citizens. Among those measures were CCTV cameras and facial recognition systems. We started looking into facial recognition. We realized that a lot of uh, projects throughout the country were being developed and were already in use. When we launched the project in November 2020, we started off with around 40 projects. And right now, in 2022, we're tracking 113 projects. Which raises the question, are authorities in India also using live facial recognition technology, which identifies people in the very moment they're being recorded? Technology that makes it virtually impossible to move through public space without potentially being tracked. The Indian Interior Ministry denied our interview request and did not answer a list of written questions. The thing with all of these police departments is um, that there is a lack of transparency as to their actions. So we don't really know um, what they're doing. We know for a fact that they're stopping people and taking photos. We know for a fact that they have a lot of CCTV cameras. It's an obvious next step to think that it is being used. It's just 2 plus 2 at this point. What is known is that India is working on one central government-operated facial recognition database, as well as other databases in areas from education to healthcare. And one of the biggest concerns of Indian civil society right now is that a lot of these databases will be interconnected and that will result in 360 degree surveillance in India. Remember how we said that big data becomes more valuable the more you have of it? Like millions of pixels that form a satellite image. That's why it's becoming increasingly attractive for governments to merge different databases they have into one gigantic one. That could be problematic because they would conflate purposes for which the specific data was collected and used uh, initially. Once personal data has been collected, it has to be collected with a purpose in mind and it has to be minimized in such a way that only the data necessary to achieve that purpose is collected. If such profiles are created and mass surveillance is effectuated, what will happen is that no one will have any privacy. A lot of people, by their very identities, you know, the community that they belong to and the opinions they hold, they might be targeted. After India gained independence in 1947, the country passed a liberal constitution and has since been known as the world's largest democracy. But since 2014, when Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his BJP party won in a landslide, observers have been warning that some of the country's key democratic pillars are in danger. We are still at least an electoral democracy. People are voting for the BJP. However, democracy is not just electoral, it's also constitutional, right? There are certain ideals of a democracy. So that, I think, is, is where India has been falling behind in the last 10 years in terms of protecting these democratic ideals. And when S.Q. Masood told the Internet Freedom Foundation about what had happened, there was no question that they would help him. Together, they wrote to the police, demanding that his data be deleted. We do not get any response uh, from, from the Hyderabad police. And then Masood decided that, you know, he wanted to take it further. 
In December 2021, he filed a petition with a local court to get more information about how his home state is using facial recognition technology. I'm trying to protect my privacy and there are a lot of people who can't uh, come out and question. So I want to take their advisors to the state. He has the support of privacy activists united in the belief that once the genie is out of the bottle, there might be no going back. We also want this petition to set the precedent for the use of facial recognition throughout the country. Masood's case is important to push back. It's very important to tell the police that not everything is going to be treated okay, whatever they are doing. And yet the rise of big data surveillance continues. That building is the new command and control center for Hyderabad police. This is where you will, they will have access to all the CCTV cameras in the city. Any data that people are collecting, the police are collecting on the street, are stored. It's a data center, essentially. Some of that data that's going to be stored there is going to be your data. Like, how does it make you feel? It makes me very, uh, I mean, it makes the entire scenario dystopic for me, okay? It's as if, to me, I live in a science fiction movie where the state has got too much power and it's constantly after you. The age of big data is here, and there's no question that it comes with great opportunities. But the same technology meant to serve us can also be used to spy on us. And with every bit of convenience we gain, we risk sacrificing a bit of privacy. That's why privacy advocates say rules are important now more than ever, even if you feel like you have nothing to hide. Because times change, governments come and go, and key democratic principles can come under threat. You may not have anything to hide, but you still have something to lose.